pseudo infection sometimes can be confused for a like cellulitis and then fracture you know even in a fracture also some many people can get confused because there is a local warm swelling but there is no fracture line seen so this is another thing and then malignancy lymphomas and leukemias are quite common in children and present like an infection i have seen so many cases where these uh, leukemia patients were uh, uh, presenting like acute osteomyelitis so one should remember you know the differential diagnosis how they this should be present so what how do we proceed now once we have a diagnosis diagnosis is there is a very less scope for conservative treatment in acute osteomyelitis in children of course very early diagnosis to the extent that you diagnose the edema in an mri scan and the, the counts are just elevating probably at that stage maybe iv antibiotics and rest and splinting might but most of the time it is invasive uh, procedures which are indicated so surgical removal of the devitalized tissues debridement extensively and we have to start on these children with empirical antibiotic empirical antibiotic has to be decided based on the hospital policy and as as i said we have to discuss uh, with the microbiologist of course we don't have a pharma clinical pharmacologist in in our country but there is a facility like that i think all these people should be involved in the management where the drug dosage the duration everything can be charted out because as orthopods you know generally the, the the knowledge of the antibiotics other than few antibiotics are, are quite poor in us so certainly we have to take help of other departments so what we have we, what we start in our hospital is because there is a hospital supply we start them on uh, cephalosporins and uh, if there is a suspicion of aggressive infection like uh, mrsa we start them on vancomycin otherwise it is uh, amikacin and ceftriaxon we start but the indicated uh, drugs are cephalosporin third generations like cefazolin cefaroxin these are the drugs which are indicated In case of MRSA, the the clindamycin and vancomycin are the first line of treatment, and linozolin should be maintained. Uh, I mean, uh, preserved for the oral dosages or um, as a second line of treatment because linozolin has got so many uh, you know uh, uh, side effects like one minor suppression, and one has to be managing this. So primary treatment should be with the vancomycin in case of MRSA. This is just an MRI. I am sharing with you this child. As I was telling you, this child is stuck with us for seven years, six, seven years now. So she is a girl with the, presented with the iliac osteomyelitis and uh, and also some kind of effusion in the joint and uh, hip joints bilateral. We went and debrided, and the whole ileum got involved very badly. You can even see some kind of a vascular insert on the femoral head. and this is the sequela and finally she ended up with a fused uh, sacroiliac joint and some consolidation and some pelvic obliquity but now that she is doing well but these are the bad cases i just wanted to remind that you know mrsa which is infecting unusual bones like ileum can present a very bad uh, problems in the leg so what is the duration of the antibiotics so this is another thing traditionally all these anti i mean chronic osteomyelitis i mean acute osteomyelitis were treated with or if you read campbells i don't know some even now also general orthopedic uh, indications are four to six weeks of intravenous antibiotics which is not practically possible especially in our country so what we are doing is it's it's based on our experience and of course based on the recent publications by certain uh, people that you know the short course intravenous antibiotics something like till the clinical uh, room and then followed by oral antibiotics for about three to four weeks this is what we do so these are the some of the studies which i was putting that you know the, this uh, so the uh, prospective randomized uh, study and proved that the short term antibiotics are quite effective in managing this and about steroids i don't really personally use the steroids but uh, there are people who are using steroids just to reduce the inflammatory load in the beginning and uh, there are supportive studies for that also Two lines about epiphyseal osteomyelitis. In osteomyelitis, uh, as all of you know, that it involves mainly the metaphyseal and diaphyseal areas, but epiphyseal osteomyelitis also can happen. So, so the, 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 in this picture, you can see that the signal changes in the proximal tibia and with some kind of a destruction going on in the rotator area. So, if you don't identify them, they 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 can lead up, they can land up with a very bad deformity later period of time. So, our own friend, Dr. Maulin and Dr. Agarwal. from uh, delhi and molin from ahmedabad they have they have done a wonderful uh, series uh, presentation in jpo recently 
So where 18 cases they saw epiphyseal osteomyelitis. Whenever you see epiphyseal osteomyelitis, the, the, the other organism to be kept in mind in children. So one common organism in our country is the tuberculosis. And it's quite common and uh, you can have bacterial infection as well. So this is just a recent experience of mine. I'm just sharing that, you know, this, this child presented with a lesion in the epiphysis we just recognized, but this child also had some amount of a, a synovitis in the knee. So we decided to do an arthroscopy first and just see and look at that. There is some kind of a deposition in the on the surface and then uh, the joint was not looking nice. So you can see that a lot of debris and synovitis. So these were the findings and then we started searching. So there was a lesion, there was a lesion from the epiphysis, which is coming out of the joint, I mean, coming out of the epiphyseal region and then entering the joint and then causing the septic arthritis. So in this video, you can see that this is in front of the ACL and just on the lateral corner, you can see a small opening where the, the infection was leaking into the joint and in turn causing the septic arthritis. So these things can happen. This is just our. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Rudra, was it uh, uh, was it tuberculosis? No, 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 no. We just like, about two days back. I'm just waiting for the. So, so send. Uh, have you sent the gene expert? No, no. We have not sent anything. We, we are waiting for the culture and gram staining. Uh, so, my, in my experience, you know, in all those uh, epiphyseal infections which were communicating with the joint, they were all were tuberculosis. I know. Because the bacterial infection, before they reach to the joint, they become very symptomatic while tuberculosis. Yeah. So I would suggest you get uh, histopathology and for tuberculosis. Yes, yes. We have, we have sent for histopathology, the bone specimen, whatever I curated, and also the yeah. fragments I have sent it for examination. We are just following it up. Yeah. So what do we do in case of uh, NICU admissions? We admit the child and immediately, as I said, we start on a septic axonomic acid because that is a septic hospital. And then if it is a septic arthritis, we go ahead with the arthrocentesis and arthrotomy to follow. If there is a septic arthritis and if there is a osteomyelitis, we decompress at the same time. So surgical decompression is a very, very important tool and uh, we have learned many, many different approaches. And... Um, so this is just, a, that is about the chronic, I mean, acute osteomyelitis. I'll be sharing, I, we have a discussion on Gigli saw uh, decompression today. And also, in fact, when I shared it with Maulin, we also started doing it. It's quite a good method. And uh, and other, other uh, it's basically the, the message is one should do a thorough debridement. And I'm going to share with you that other thing, what we do. So surgical debridement is important. If there is an infection which goes on for a chronicity, it's an extensive approach and uh, thorough debridement and then uh, you know, uh, cure touch. So this is just a diagram to show that the, the, the windows which are made, um, if there is a long bone involved, probably whatever the length of bone involved, which we come to know by MRI and other clinical findings, we can just make a windows and uh, pass the decrease of do a thorough debridement. I'm sure Maulin is going to show today some uh, videos and techniques. So Rudra, you should send that picture to me. You should gift it to me. I will. I will give you. I'll give you. <laughs> That's. So this is another thing. Uh, you know what I found is very useful because the joint replacement surgeons. You know they 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 use what is called pulse lavage with a gun. I think all of you must have seen it. And I started recently using it. This is a very good tool. And you don't have to buy this. This costs around uh, 4,000, 3,000, something like that. And we can use it for four or five children. And so I have asked my friends to gift from different corporate hospitals and we keep these things in the hospital and then we use it. So I'll just show you the video. You can appreciate how nicely this pulse lavage uh, gives a very good pressure inside the medullary canal. And then, you know, uh, you can even pass a tube and then you can, uh, so this, this goes with the pressure. So this gives a nice wash in the intramedullary canal. So you can make as many windows as possible. And this is a battery, the striker, you can attach it and this is the gun. So this is a useful thing, you know. So, so whenever there is a chronic osteomyelitis, we have to make a good window, good uh, bone decompression we have to do. And let me tell you a few things about the biocomposite. Whenever the infection comes into 
uh, the chronic infections, we have this uh, biocomposites that is a calcium sulfate matrix, which is available. And then we can mix the antibiotics, which are there, like tobramycin, vancomycin, all this, whatever, and jetamycin. So this, these three antibiotics are recognized by this company, but we have used other antibiotics also. So basically, it's a local antibiotic delivery system where the, 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 the calcium sulfate crystals will have the antibiotic with them and gradually release it as they get uh, resolved. That's the concept. And I must share that, you know, my own friend, Dr. Jayant and Vikas and Girish have combinedly uh, published this paper, very nice paper from JPO 2021. So where they have uh, said that most of the infection can be eradicated. So Stimulan is a nice system. Of course, it's a little expensive, but certainly affordable nowadays and we can use it. So to conclude my talk, let me tell you that one should have a high index of suspicion about early diagnosis. Not only early diagnosis, one should have suspicion about the organisms which may be involved. Like uh, I was telling you about epiphyseal astromyelitis, one should think about tuberculosis. If it is a so a child below two years, three years wants to think about Kingella Kinge also. And, uh, and uh, in an infant, one should start, I mean, one should suspect septo and uh, gram negative organisms more commonly and then use the antibiotic for that age, which is appropriate, which is very important because everything is not staph aureus as we study in, in, in pediatrics. And then, as I said, it's most of the time it is a surgical intervention, there is no conservative management options, very less options. And as I said with the, um, the reasoning, the short-term parental antibiotic is good enough to have a good resolving you know, infection. And uh, we have to protect against the late sequelae. And we should be, as I said, be aware about the rare organisms, especially when they affect the rare bones like ileum, which I showed you. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Molin and uh, group. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for this wonderful talk and uh, don't forget that uh, giggly sova picture <laughs> because we are yet to publish it. So uh, whenever we we send for publication, we will attach that photograph as well. Certainly. Courtesy Dr. Rudra. So Sheenam, uh, please uh, take the questions. Okay, sir. Uh, first question is, how long would you wait with antibiotics? Uh, before surgery? In oct acute osteomyelitis. Yes. Acute osteomyelitis. Uh, see, see, now we have uh, very good diagnostic tools. We have ultrasound, we have MRI scan, and more than anything, we have a clinical judgment. As I discussed, the clinical judgment is the most important. How bad is the child with respect to toxic response? For example, the child which is not allowing you to touch, there is a swelling, and uh, MRI is showing wide involvement of the marrow. I don't think so. You have to wait. You know, there is no question of waiting. It's basically empirically you're going to start the antibiotic and as soon as possible, you're going to intervene with the surgical intervention, decompress the bone, give a thorough wash, make your antibiotic reach that area. That's the whole concept. Yeah. So typically, so, you know, I, uh, in a case of acute osteomyelitis, I give IV antibiotics for 48 hours. And if child continues to have pain, fever, then I feel that the intramedullary pressure is so much that antibiotic is no more working, not reaching there. And then we should go with the drainage. And at times, if it's an advanced disease, then we have to react early. So next question was, Rudra, which antibiotics you would start uh, at the outset before the culture report comes? Yeah. So as I discussed, you see, it again depends on the local antibiotic policy. You need to have a microbiologist sync with your decision because uh, tomorrow if something going wrong and then you ask them, they say that you didn't inform me. We don't know. We don't know what's happening. So see, we have an idea. And it's also depending on the general infections, what the microbiologist is seeing in the hospital. Microbiologists are the people, you know, they're seeing general infection. They're not only seeing only osteomyelitis, they see other Speciality, you know, like uh, pediatricians are referring for meningitis and other things. So they know better, you know, what are the organisms prevalent in that area, in that, in that setup, you know. Uh, so, so in our hospital, it is most of the time it is a referral. So what we start is, as I said, septrioxone is the drug which we start on the initial day because 
it has got a good coverage for both gram positive and negative. In case of an infants and neonates, in case of children more than five years, of course we we give importance to MSSA or MRSA as the primary pathogen, and still we have used the ceftriaxone. Still, it is good effect, good you know in those organisms. And along with this, we have always used the gram negative coverage is amic acid. This is our practice. Ceftriaxone and amic acid is what we use in general. So the same thing uh, in our private setup. What I have seen that if if you see a multifocal infection, or there is a significant uh, compartment or widening of thigh or the extremity, then you should suspect the septic thrombosis of the uh, vein, and this is usually we see with MRSA. in those cases we start with a vancomycin we i attended an infectious disease conference uh, recently with a pediatrician and the policy which they suggested is to hit hard and hit early and they recommend using vancomycin and uh, micacin or ceftriaxone to start start with and the blood culture and the tissue culture would come in 48 hours and then you may de escalate from vanco to ceftriaxone if it is an mssa so i have uh, started using that for long time i have also used uh, linezolid because linezolid has very limited side effects while vancomycin as is redman syndrome can happen so uh, we have to give very slowly and those things but uh, vanco and ceftriaxone combination we start uh, and then we de escalate or reduce the drugs accordingly Yes. Do we have another question, uh, Dr. Shina? No, sir. Right. So thanks, Rudra, for that wonderful talk and overview. And uh, that was an overview. Now I'll share you uh, share one case with all of us. And. Kider gaya hai abhi. And uh, that will. so let me go out and then come back uh, okay this pc and desktop desktop pc jani ko please uh, wait for a moment and i'll i'll share my presentation desktop pe hai ye share screen kiya idhar ja ke desktop no oh, yeah okay this So, uh, can you see my slide? No, everyone. No, no, sir. No, not it. Not it. Ah, you you have to unshare and please ah, stop sharing and share again, right? Abhi. Yes. Oh, we can see now. Right, right. So, I'll uh, I'm going to share uh, just single case which takes you through the. management dilemma you know and uh, i'm i'm sure it will teach many points which rudra uh, covered in his talk somehow i have created a poll uh, shalin but as is ortho tv guys are sharing i mean they also this polls are not seen anyways so this is a 6 years old boy who fell from bicycle and he had a blunt trauma along left upper leg 
they went to see an orthopedic surgeon and was prescribed some analgesics after seeing normal x-ray so this was the x-ray and uh, this was uh, prescribed an analgesic that this would be just blunt trauma now at one week child started developing fever and had a spike of 101 degrees and there was swelling along proximal medial tibia which was warm with overlying uh, cellulitic changes and c reactive protein was 20 and count were marginally raised and x ray was again normal so orthopedic surgeon uh, now let's see take the poll now in this situation x ray is normal crp is 20 and there was cellulitis over tibia so what would you have done so let there are four options and you can take the poll and put it in chat box that uh, would you start oral antibiotics you would do usg or an mri or ind you for the cellulitic changes so please put in chat box yes i'll give you 10 seconds okay raman will do ind chinmay is in america so he says both usg followed by mri dr neeraj joshi from bhavnagar he would say mri so yeah so um, so we are not contemplating what is right or what is wrong but uh, i felt that 70% people think that mri should be done a couple of people thinks that uh, think that uh, usg will tell you about whether this uh, soft tissue abscess is connecting to the superiosteal space few of you are aggressive they want to do an ind no no one said that oral antibiotic will uh, is a choice but our um, let's see what uh, orthopedic uh, colleague did he gave uh, oral antibiotics yeah so he prescribed oral antibiotics because x ray was normal so the first point to remember and as you will understand with the progress of this case that a normal x ray does not mean that there is no bone infection it requires 40% bone to be destroyed to be seen on x ray as a lytic uh, lesion okay so uh, we must understand normal x ray that does not mean there is no bone penetration we should take make all the efforts to see whether this just soft tissue infection or it's an associated bone infection now let's see the story ahead at two weeks patient is still febrile and they again approached orthopedic surgeon and now swelling has increased in size and is fluctuant so there is an abscess formation and at present at as a repeat x ray was done third x ray which was also normal and so orthopedic surgeon thought that this is not my case this this is uh, bone is not involved so let me refer them to a surgeon so patient was referred to a general surgeon that there is an abscess so you do ind and uh, x ray is normal so it's not my job and ind was done by the surgeon which was the first surgery for this child so now poll 2 is what you would have done in this situation let me give you four options you would have done same would you have referred this child to surgeon or you have given iv antibiotics or you would have investigated so garo says mri yeah chinmay is of similar opinion shinam punit need dr neeraj bhai yes and raman said i would do ind and uh, if see that whether if it is communicating the superiosteal i would drain it uh okay that's not a bad approach but raman you know it's um, doing directly ind may i mean may not give you the extent of total disease bone debridement if if it is involved i agree but we have seen you know uh, skip lesions in distal metaphysis and sometimes just doing ind and drilling in this case may not be sufficient so my personal answer to this would be to 
image and do MRI probably if possible. So let's see what our friend did. So the surgeon did IND, but the IND side is still pouring pus at three weeks. And he got confused that usually when I do IND in two, three days, the, uh, the pus stops coming out. But in this side, for one week, the pus kept on coming. And now the swelling has appeared on the other side of proximal tibia. And so he confidently drained the other side. He said there must be cellulitis on the other side, which has localized with antibiotics. So let me drain the other side. Okay. So this was the second surgery. So now the patient is still a with the general surgeon. So all clinical parameters in favor of acute osteoma. Yes, Raman, I agree with you. But this is the patient who was in the periphery of Ahmedabad and the orthopedic surgeon thought this way. So he uh, transferred the care to the general surgeon. So he did second surgery, second IND on the lateral side and see what happens. Now it is five weeks. Now the discharge has reduced from IND side. So surgeon and the family is happy. But child when started weight bearing, he complained of pain in the upper leg. So again, orthopedic reference was done that now it is bone pain. So you go to orthopedic surgeon and he got another x-ray. And now this is the x-ray picture. So we must remember that 70% of extremity abscess has underlying bone involvement. Unless there is preceding factor like a local, a local insect bite or a local trauma or low IV line extravasation in uh, young children. Now we have done this study and the 70% of extremity abscess underlying bone involvement. And so always go for an ultrasound or an MRI. Uh, when there is absence of this pre preceding factors. So let's see now what happened. At two and a half months, the orthopedic surgeon said the child is already on antibiotics. The wounds are not draining much. So he again gave some an analgesics and uh, he gets USG because the uh, pain persisted. And our uh, radiologist says there is some subperiosteal collection and metaphyseal irregularity. So now the surgeon did the drainage of subperiosteal space and made some drill holes in proximal tibial metaphysis. Okay. That was the third surgery. So let, let me ask you again, do you agree with the treatment and what should be the action now? Let me give you the options. Yes, I will allow the child for weight bearing as tolerated. Yes, the option was okay. I will apply plaster till child becomes asymptomatic. No, this was not appropriate management. I would have added local antibiotic delivery system and D, no, I would have got further imaging. So please show your polls. So Punit says, yes, plaster. Gaurav when Chinmay wants to do MRI. Chinam also keen on getting MRI. Uh, Nira Joshi says a local antibiotic system like Stimulan. Plaster. Jakub says D. Now, whoever has made this marking, you know, would it disappear in next slide or it would remain there? I have not made it. You says um, local antibiotic delivery system. I agree. See, uh, in this cases, you know, when multiple surgeries are done, we need to know the extent of disease. We think that uh, just doing by multiple drill holes, the intramedullary pressure will get decompressed. But we have seen, we do not want to make drill holes. We want to make a small window so that it would allow us to completely decompress, not only the metaphysis, but also the medullary canal. Now, without MRI, it is difficult to uh, assess whether the, it is a panosseous disease or it was, uh, uh, it's a local metaphyseal disease. The culture showed uh, staph aureus. Okay. So let's see what happens next. So the surgeon, orthopedic surgeon said, I will allow weight bearing as tolerated. So that was pretty uh, 
a non conventional management was done now at 5 months child suddenly stops walking and again the orthopedic surgeon uh, was consulted and this is the x ray picture okay so now what you can see here is Gaurav, can you read this X-ray? What is happening? Yes, sir. So now there are pathological fractures seen in the shaft and the and the proximal metaphysis. Hmm. So one can see these drill holes, and one must remember that uh, a spontaneous pathological fracture can happen at the junction of diseased and undiseased area. uh in osteomyelitis when this periosteal health is no good okay so a circumferential abscess makes the underlying periosteum devitalized and makes it prone for pathologic fracture and this paper in jbjs 2010 must be read this is from tsra i'll share that paper later now my poll uh, is what should be done now the patient has a pathological fracture at both hands should we do plaster immobilization with dressing through window a debridement and exfix or elizaro debridement and antibiotic mixed nail or further imaging please put your poll and the the person who has done marking you know please remove it so gorav wants further imaging chinmay wants further imaging raman says uh, remove the dead bone Shinam says uh, further imaging, debridement and exfix or Elizaro. Raman says uh, debridement, put him in cast. Right. So many options, uh, many thought process. One can also think of putting some uh, uh, the spacer or something. But the, first of all, we need to see whether the underlying bone is completely devitalized or it is partially viable but let's see what the surgeon uh, the treating doctor tried to do he thought that this is a small child so it will heal so let me give plaster and we'll do dressing through the window so this is what was done so he kept on doing dressings with through the window patient was immobilized and at 8 months this was the clinical picture plaster was removed and patient shifted to our care patient came to us and said now we we want to see now um, chinmay can you read this x ray on the right side what do you see yes sir uh, now we can clearly see in the proximal third part there is a tibialis bone which is uh, showing the pathological fracture also with the sequestrum or all around all around it in the middle of the medullary canal and the shaft uh, and the in, uh, involvement of the bone is up to the lower third middle third junction uh, and in the uh, yeah sorry yes yeah, so there is an uh, uh, a small sequestra in the distal part rudra how would you manage this full condition now yeah. so uh, anyway but the imaging is not done still the mri is not available no okay anyway at this stage i think uh, this is going to end up in a gap non union we have faced similar situations you know this this little fragment is going to come out and uh, followed by a good debridement and just maintain the length by whatever means probably external fixator or even even a simple slab and then our another option would be antibiotic uh, impregnated cement in that area like a spacer and then uh, what we have done is after some 8 weeks or 6 weeks we go remove that cement spacer and immediately do either uh, bone transport that, that that's the, that's the best uh, option i would think of yeah the cases right so so i had a similar uh, similar thought process that i would do bone transport and uh, as fibula is intact the length is maintained and uh, with a fixator uh, also so i did not at that point i think i did this case in way back in 2011 so i did not um, put any cement spacer but uh, we removed the sequestrum and placed a elizaro frame and uh, even i did not get mri because i am i was going to open everything and deprive 
it. So with the using of pediatric reamers, we decompress the canal, thoroughly lavaged, and then put the frame thinking that once the infection settles down, we'll do distal corticotomy and transport. So that was the fourth surgery for this poor child. And then I came to, uh, uh, I came to see this paper from our Sandeep Patwardhan and colleagues from Pune, uh, that reconstruction of bone defects after osteomyelitis with non-vascularized fibula graft. And we all uh, read the abstracts of paper and not papers in detail. So I jumped to put a fibula graft thinking that this will reduce the time of treatment so six weeks after primary procedures, when the CRP and counts were normal, there was no evidence of any discharge, the wound, everything was looking fine. I placed the fibula. Now later realized that uh, uh, the Sandeep and colleagues say that there should not be diameter difference. When you put a graft, so this fibula strut graft works very well in numerous, uh, in a proximal, uh, in the, uh, the forearm. But when it comes to tibia and femur, the, when diameter mismatch is there, it might fail. But in other, in this case, what happened, everything was fine. That was a fifth surgery. The question to all of you is, would you agree with this sort of management? Yes or no? As the bed was dry, I placed fibula and did some bone grafting, iliac crest grafting. Would you have done the same? Uh, please give your poll. Shinam would have done same. Punit, no. Neeraj Bhai say no. Yakub say yes. Yeah, Gaurav says I will put two straights, uh, two struts or bone transport. Yes. So, uh, Punit, what would you have done? Can you tell us? Hello, sir. I'm yeah, audible. Punit. Yes, sir. Uh, like uh, we are, uh, if you are using a fibula graft, uh, since the bone ends are not very healthy, uh, uh, our expectation of union with the non-vascular fibula, fibula graft will be uh, like a little uh, too much to ask for, sir. What I would have done is uh, probably uh, done a fibulectomy, then slowly dock the two ends and later on lengthen the tibia rather than going for a transport in this case. Right. So that, that will be again a, a long surgical time, but that is also an option. I agree with you. So let's see uh, what happens next. Uh, I did this uh, fibula grafting and patient called after three weeks for suture removal. But when I called, the father was very angry with me. There is frank pus discharge from the wound. So it happens. So sometimes, you know, for six weeks or eight weeks, you, the, the bed looks okay and you perform a surgery and the infection gets flared up. That's what happened in this case. There was a frank pus discharge and the whole fibula was sequestrated. So what can be done now? So now cutting the story short, we did, uh, we removed the fibula, we debrided the thing, whatever dirty tissue was there. And uh, we did the distal corticotomy and started doing transport, which was a sixth surgery. And uh, then as we did the extensive debridement, fortunately, there was no infection uh, at the proximal site. Bone grafting was done once the docking happened. And you can see the distal uh, area was virgin and it threw good new bone, which was a seventh surgery. The frame was removed after consolidation and plaster was applied for four weeks, which was the eighth surgery. And after plaster removal, child was allowed to bear weight with PTV breasts, first time after one and a half years. And uh, this is five years follow-up of that boy. He's 11 years old now, and he's walking like this. So what I mean to say is a simple uh, acute osteomyelitis, which due to the ignorance about not all soft tissue abscess are just soft tissue. We should look beyond. This child lost about one and a half, two years of his life uh, because of a small ignorance. So I want all of you to become a torch bearer that whenever you see 
a soft tissue infection in a child without preceding uh, factors, always investigate. If not MRI, then, ul then ultrasound. And as Gaurav rightly said, this would have avoided if we would have been aware of this phenomenon. And I'm, I'm glad that this 20 people are witnessing this case and they will uh, teach in their, their uh, groups uh, that how to deal with this. And this five years follow up. The nature is so uh, forgiving. The fibula looks good. The mom said, what happened to that fibula which we took? But that fibula has regenerated very well. Yes, Raman, your comment. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Good morning. Yes. Actually, uh, this is definitely a great savior for the child, right? But I, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to like uh, know from your expert opinion and Dr. Rudra sir's opinion. Uh, this is like five years back. The child was around five or six when this uh, the whole picture, uh, whole scene started to be created, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when he first went with the acute osteomyelitis. And then there was a stage when there was a dead bone in between and still there was some pus. So means we have been taught like if you deprive it thoroughly and stabilize the joints, then in this small age group, like in this age group of uh, small children, like uh, four a year, five year, three years, the whole bone start to reappear yeah. again. The whole, I mean, this, Osteomyelitis thing is taken care yeah. of. So this is so, a false teaching. I'm very boldly, I will tell you. Okay. This is a false teaching. Now, Rudra and me and many, all of us have seen many gap non-unions in children as young as one year, two year, three year. See, what is important to understand is periosteum has two sources of blood supply. One is intramedullary and other is compartmental. So intramedullary blood supply cuts off when there is acute osteomyelitis because of increased intramedullary pressure. So all the uh, intramedullary blood supply gets blocked. Now, when there is a circumferential abscess in the muscle compartments, that will also obliterate the compartmental blood supply. So that underlying periosteum will become dead to throw new bone. So when there is a long-standing infection like this, with uh, devitalized overlying periosteum, those children will go into gap non-union. Now, Gaurav has shared one paper of us. So we have published this paper on which are the factors which affect the outcome of chronic osteomyelitis. So don't be in that a uh, false uh, information that young children, if stabilized, they will do well. No, we have to uh, drain the abscess both the intramedullary as well as compartmental so that the blood supply of periosteum quickly restarts so that it can throw involucrum. If patient has uh, elapsed four or five weeks since the disease or there is circumferential uh, abscess, those children are highly likely to develop gap non-union at any age. I will share that paper and you, we all should read it. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. That. Right. So, I think learning points uh, from this is underlying bone involvement should be ruled out. MRI-based disease debridement is paramount. Prevention is better than cure. Stands true. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. And... Uh, Shalin, uh, I mean, uh, Gaurav, you can share your screen. Rudra, any, any comment uh, on this? Yeah, I'm just about that uh, last case, what Dr. Raman was asking, the same thing. You know, we, we, we as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, we should understand that, you know, uh, the bone, the bone formation happens because of many reasons. One is it should have a blood vessel, it should have a periosteum, and, or some kind of a medullary canal, there should be something. If everything is gone, then from where the where does the bone come? In fact, with this, you know, nice joke I must share. You know, one of my pediatric uh, surgery colleagues always used to say that there is nothing there in pediatric doctor. Any broken bone, you just put it in a room, they unite. 
this this is a concept you know we should not uh, we should not adapt so i think the, the 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 best solution is to have a good knowledge about certain things like for example the proximal tibia it's a, it's a vascularly compromised area only one nutrient uh, artery enters there and then if that is gone that's why we commonly see these areas going into non unions and gap non unions so yeah gaurav start your case i hope i am audible and my screen is visible yeah okay so let us start with the case so this is a one and a half year old child presented with complaints of fever pain and purulent discharge from the proximal and medial aspect of his left leg since 3 weeks and as sir shown in his previous case that he also went ind incision drainage over the proximal aspect of left leg elsewhere but still the wound was not healing and there was continuous purulent discharge these were his x rays when he presented to us so we we straight away got an mri as our protocol and we found that the infection was extending throughout the tibia till the lower end and there was so go back to the x ray gorav right sir so i remember that uh, before this orthopedic colleague drained it the x ray was normal right so he did the just ind and then uh, the as the pus kept on coming they got an imaging and now they show this is a pan osseous osteomyelitis and patient was referred to us so again this is the same story as we discussed in the last case yeah right. go ahead yeah so we can see on the mri that there is a significant periosteal elevation and intermedullary collection throughout the uh, canal so so as learned from sir pan medullary decompression and debridement was carried out using a giggly saw wire as we can't use solid reamers from a single port or we have to make multiple entries or slit the bone so to avoid all those thing we use giggly saw wire and drainage of sub periosteal and intermuscular abscess was also done so this is a small video to show how it is done and why it is done so we know that solid reamers are difficult to negotiate into the canal of kids whereas the giggly saw wire is serrated throughout and is flexible enough to be to be negotiated into the canal so we make an entry where the maximum infection is and then through that entry we we make a access into the intermedullary canal and then we negotiate our giggly saw wire by bending its tip and we try to transport it throughout the canal and then we ream with the with the met, uh, with the giggly saw wire through all the walls multiple times rotating it in all the directions so that we we remove all the necrotic tissue sticking around the canal and in the canal similar uh, depiction of uh, by pictures and then yes and then we lavage the canal with a infant feeding tube and so in this case we did the same and this is the same child after one month of surgery and this is the same child after six months of surgery now we can see that the bone is consolidating the infection has healed and now the uh, cortex is thickening and this is the same child at six years there was no limb length discrepancy and growth plates were normal and the infection healed well so uh, i just wanted to tell that this is a similar case as shown by sir but then early timely intervention and right intervention thorough debridement saved around 2 years and a lot of morbidity of the child so this is open for discussion thank you sir for giving me this opportunity and this case is is shared i mean it's sir's case which i which i saw and and i am using it from the permission of sir i learned it from during my fellowship time thank you sir thank you gaurav uh, so this this case i mean i can <clears throat> send this to uh, all of you you all can present it wherever in your meetings because this is a good learning point to decompress the narrow canal without disturbing the uh, the what you say the bony anatomy further 
So, Rudra, your comments, and then we'll go for the next case. Yeah, I just wanted to, because see, when I discussed with you about this, uh, when you were here last time, three years back, two, two, two years back, mm -hmm. I started doing the same thing, but the only problem what we found was the giglis always comes in rotated, you know. It doesn't come like a straight uh, wire. It's always wound up and then, then it is supplied, you know, that's how it is supplied. But when... When we want to insert that completely, many a time it doesn't go to the desired length. It goes to some uh, place and then it gets stuck and you know we start. But I understand that you know wherever there is a loosening or there is a more infection, this would negotiate till there and then it won't go further into the normal bone. It requires more force. So this is my observation, just a comment. So, uh, so depending on the size of canal, you know. What we have done with a plier, we have compressed the loop of giggly saw. And we have just bent it a little bit so that it can be negotiated. And uh, it will go through. Like So we have to make sure that this is... Uh, now, If uh, we have seen that at some point, it does not go through the distal uh, diaphysis. Then what you do is you do a double giggly saw. So bend it half and then yeah, curl yeah. it. And then, because there it will be more force and you will be able to do that. The second thing is, you can, uh, uh, you should avoid using same wire again and again because if you use wire, they are very fragile. The third thing is, uh, the giggly saw wire can be local made and there is a very standard made. So, I have always been using Ormed. So, it, that Ormed giggly saws are very strong. And you, you are not in fear that it will break down. In my early practice, we had one case where uh, the giggly saw wire was broken and inside. And uh, we were not able to retrieve, you know, because it was a bit higher. So we, I told family that it is there. And if uh, there is something, then I'll make another window above and remove it. But fortunately, that uh, child healed completely and Till date, before and it was, it happened before ten years. There is no symptom. So giggly saw wire is a new technique. We all should have faith in, and uh, it has worked. Now, why my paper, which has been sent to many places, has not been accepted so far? Where we do not have controls. For me, controls are the patients who have been treated by other orthopedic surgeon by just doing local drill holes, and they kept on draining or inadequate debridement are the controls for me. That's why I uh, started doing this. But I'm uh, trying to get it published with uh, uh, by some, you know, uh, some adjustments and some further detailing of the study. Right. So the, th this giggly saw wire technique uh, should be um, used. It's, it has been greatly helpful to all of us. Yes, Chinmay, you would like to share your screen? Yes, sir. Uh, Abba, question about uh, embolism with uh, pulse lavage. Well, pulse lavage is done in all these uh, adult orthopedic surgeries as well. You know, I doubt that the pulmonary embolism which you are talking about might be a part of MRSA disease. The MRSA osteomyelitis has a triad. It's known as lethal triad of osteomyelitis, uh, septic thromboembolism of the venous system and septic pulmonary emboli. So, Last month, we treated two cases. Both of them have pulmonary embolism. And uh, so it might not be due to pulse lavage, but it might be due to the disease itself. What do you say, Rudra? What is your experience? Yeah, the same thing. I don't think so pulse lavage. See, even in uh, acute uh, debridements, so sometimes we put this rail tube or some tube inside the canal, wherever we go, and then we give it the under pressure. If pulse lavage, you know, can cause embolism, even the, you know, the pressure, under pressure injecting also should come. But I don't think so. That's the reason. As you said, the infect infection and then local thrombi, all these things are the reasons. And then pulse lavage is not going to create uh, so much of pressure that, you know, you are dislodging into a vessel, especially inside a bone. It's very much unlikely. Right. Chinmay, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, myself, Dr. Chinmay. I'm presenting a case of osteomyelitis fever. So, a local orthopedic surgeon from Tursil called me and he told me that I am referring you a patient which is a 10 years old, a girl, which is a known case of sickle cell anemia. She is unable to weight bear 
and having a high grade fever since last 10 15 days so i asked about a little about the past history so in past history she had a blood transfusion 2 months back on the day 2 she had a fire, uh, fever spike which was subsided by taking some uh, antibiotic medication but no uh, no antibiotics and swelling around the knee uh, was noticed around 10 to 15 days after that and it was aspirated two times by local orthopedic surgeon and the culture was sent and it shows that it comes uh, e coli and appropriate antibiotic was started but as the knee swelling get uh, repeatedly uh, repeated knee swelling is there there is a toxic look high grade fever and she was now unable to wet beer so after she comes to me after two months uh, taking uh, the treatment all over the place she come to the district place and on clinical examination she is having persistent tox look and toxic look tender to touch around the knee and the proxim uh, knee and the uh, femur unable to perform the range of motion in hip and knee the ankle are free minimal patellar tap is positive no distal neurovascular deficit upper limb and other limb examination were normal on the investigation her blood count is a uh, uh, 9.8 platelet was on lower side 154 wbc is 15000 crp is raised and esr is 40 by considering the clinical examination and the investigational uh, investigational part uh, it's fall into the CRED algorithm, which suggested that it must be a septic arthritis, which suggests that unable, unable to wear bed, fever, blood count, ESR, and the CRP. Uh, CRP. But is it uh, only a septic joint? Because by looking on the examination uh, or uh, the chronicity of the disease since last two months, I think it should, it not, not just only the septic joint, it must be a more. So I, uh, I found a, one paper in the literature by Rosenfeld, which was published in JPO, we suggest you uh, they uh, come up with the five variables, age, CRP, duration of symptom, platelet at ANC. So age greater than four, CRP greater than 13.8, duration greater than three, platelet count less than 340, and ANC greater than 8.6. If any uh, three positive variables are present, you can go directly for the preoperative MRI to look for the osteomyelitis, which also involving the septic arthritis. By following this paper, I go for the MRI and we can see there is a inter uh, pan osseous osteomyelitis with a pus pocket in a, on the medial as well as on the lateral side. On the uh, joint line, there is a epiphyseal osteomyelitis also present with a gross destruction of the joint cartilage, which was present after two months to me. Uh, on, of course, I also go for the X-ray. On the X-ray, we can see there is a joint destruction uh, as well as there is a no a maintenance of the joint line and there is a subluxation of the joint. And this child is in persistent fever in a toxic and he, she is in little, going towards the septic uh, shock. Uh, so my plan will be the parent counseling. The parent counseling in the form of that the joint is destructed uh, right now for getting rid of the infection is more important rather than uh, is more important for me, drainage of the medial pocket, uh, medial uh, pocket pus, jiggly saw, medullary canal drainage and dead space management. Uh, so this is the uh, video which I uh, go a medial side pocket drainage. We can, you can clearly say there is a gush of the pus will come out like this uh, from the medial. I mean, you open it and do a finger dissection, uh, hesitant to put any artery or anything inside it and do all finger uh, uh, dissection and put all the medullary pus, which was sent for pus culture and sensitivity. And the, uh, similarly, uh, from the lateral side, I uh, made a window and as, as, as Gaurav sir and Molin sir taught me about the uh, medullary decompression, I put the uh, jiggly saw and you can see there is a continuous gush of pus coming from the medullary canal. Uh, similarly, I am not able to go for the proximal part, so I made a window in the proximal part of the femur and uh, again go for uh, go for the jiggly saw. And this is the technique uh, which was which is which was taught me to, by Dr. Molin sir. And uh, because uh, we uh, thoroughly debride this space, there is a continuous gush of pus coming from the bone. Uh, I thought uh, the dead space management is also important in this cell, so I go with the uh, PMA uh, polymethyl arcalate cement plus vancomycin and put it over a uh, um, SS wire and uh, kept inside the joint for the local uh, local antibiotic uh, action uh, inside the femur joint. And uh, in the post-op protocol, I have kept the child non-weight bearing, uh, CRP between 48 to 70 hours, X-ray on 14 days, oral antibiotics were continued for six weeks, the pus culture came E. coli positive again, and, uh, it was, and he is positive for ceprofloxin, and the removal of beads was done after the six weeks. So after uh, after three months, as I expected, there will be a uh, there will be a joint deformity. So we can clearly see there is a proximal uh, 
proximal tibia deformity, the tibia is going into the varus. Uh, on the walking side, uh, she is walking uh, with support and without support both, but her knee is getting very stiff. Uh, she is hardly able to do a 20 degree of knee flexion. Uh, this is another uh, view. Uh, she can walk, uh, she is unable to walk uh, properly because of the no knee flexion at the joint line. So the antibiotic bits was removed after six weeks, uh, but when the antibiotic bits were removed, I was not there. I uh, came here for my fellowship in San Diego. So parents will counsel about the further management, but uh, parents not are not yet ready for to get in, uh, for the further management. The situation for me right now is uh, about the stiff knee and a proximal knee, uh, proximal tibial deformity, which I once go over there and will see for the full length X-ray, see for the joint line deformity and the repeat MRI will look for the, any cartilage, uh, uh, how are the position of the cartilage and we'll uh, proceed further. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jinmay. Yes. Yeah, so Rudra, your comments Jinmai. on this. Uh, because when you showed that, uh, you know, there was a effusion in the joint and it was looking like a septic arthritis, this is something like the same what I presented, but did you uh, thought about septic arthritis, which is connecting into the knee and did you do something uh, to know what's happening inside the knee? Yes, yeah, sir. I also drained for the knee joint also, sir. I have, uh, knee joint also drained, uh, but there is no much, there is only infected synovium inside the joint. And no as such collection was seen on the MRI also, but uh, on clinically examination, there is a minimal patellar tap positive, but when I open it, uh, after all, there is only infected synovium, sir. So I but anyway, see, look, looking at the involvement, like this is practically a septic arthritis along with an osteomyelitis. And even the x-ray also shows when there is a loss of the medial, whole tibial condyle, obviously everything is involved. And uh, probably, you know, arthroscopic synovectomy or thorough debridement, I think it's, it's, it's a good option to, you should have cons considered, you know, that's what I feel. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, I also spoke with my orthoscopic surgeon, but they don't have the special pediatric scope. So I have to go for the open uh, debridement of the joint. Uh, by opening the all the joint, I able to remove as much as possible and thorough aggressive debridement was done uh, in the same setting, sir. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> those who have not trained for arthroscopy, you know, it's something, it's a simple two portal thing and uh, many primary septic arthritis can be drained with arthroscopy. Of course, when if you're not trained, you do an arthrotomy, that's not, not a problem. But in similar, in such cases, doing multiple incisions, you can use arthroscopy as well. Now, for all sequel cell, you know, before you embark on the treatment, of course, your case was infected. You must see the child should not be in sickle cell crisis. Sickle yes, cell crisis with low hemoglobin and uh, a patient is dehydrated. Many a times the pain and symptoms are more from the sickle cell crisis than the infection. I'm not talking about your case. Your case is kind of neglected and burnt out septic arthritis. So the management uh, which you have done is fine. And... Uh, Many a times, you know, when there are multiple treatment has been done and there is repeated or recurrent infection, I have used stimulant. Uh, I've never used uh, putting that cemented antibiotic beads on a nail because I do not want to do another surgery, you know. Uh, so at times I have done multiple small drill holes and through those drill holes I have poured stimulant beads so that it will reach intermedullary. Uh, then there are also some ways of, uh, of uh, putting uh, this similar beads through a small incision. But that's fine, uh, putting that there's an old technique. Uh, also, what you can do is, besides putting two wires from there, you can put a straight rod, antibiotic mixed nail, which would uh, elaborate Venko and Genta, depending on the culture which can be placed from the greater trochanter, which will also give you stability to prevent any fracture and that you can remove easily with a single incision at the top. But okay. it's a difficult and challenging case and uh, there is instability at the knee joint. Uh, osteoarthritis is already established, so this child would need joint replacement sooner. Yes, sir. And uh, at the same time, correction of deformity can be done later. 
so i think thank you everyone for this lovely uh, session uh, thanks rudra for your valuable inputs you poured your experience and i'm i'm hopeful this uh, this session will be of great help to everyone thank so you we are over suited by thank 20 you. minutes i'm stop recording yeah so thanks rudra thank you thank you very much molin nice to see chinmay in full flow and uh, nice to see his confidence growing i'm very proud of him good thank you for the uh, chinmay yeah right on take care yes, guys bye bye thank you bye bye you, have a nice weekend don't, don't forget to send me that picture i will i will i will i will buy <laughs> it for you please thank you thank you bye bye take care i'll i'll uh, end the meeting